It's Friday the 26th of February. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and it's time for an update. Just got back from our London trip, long 48 hour layover. About an 11 hour flight from London to Los Angeles. This time we flew another almost record breaking for me load of cargo, 90, in a correction, 89,000 pounds of cargo, of which the most of it was salmon. <laughs> so we got the asparagus over to England, California asparagus, and we got the Atlantic salmon from England over here to California. We burned about 180, for those of you that are keeping track, we burned about, a, this kind of interesting factoids, burned about 187,000 pounds of fuel, took 11 hours to fly the 5,000 mile trip. That's about an average of 2,500 gallons per hour, as Avgas weighs about 6.8 pounds per gallon. So if you work that out, that works out about three tenths of a gallon of gas for every one pound of cargo. And if you look at the 777 as a passenger hauler, hauling over 300 passengers, take out that cargo and instead have the 300 passengers, it works out to be a very efficient way of moving people. So as expected, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon issued an emergency airworthiness directive effectively grounding those aircraft that are affected with the Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engines with these affected fan blades. The only three carriers that I know of that this affects at this time is United Airlines, Japan Airlines, and Al Nippon Airlines. What this means is the aircraft are grounded and they've got to redo the TAI or Thermal Acoustic Imaging Inspection and we're going to talk about that extensively here in this update. So they've got to pull the fan blades off of the aircraft so they can just park the aircraft where they're at. They can easily pull the fan blades off of the aircraft by removing the spinner, removing the fan retainer clip. You maybe have to remove some um, spacers in between the fan blades, and then you can pull those fan blades off of the engine by pulling them forward. Each fan blade, each set of fan blades comes in a set, a set of two fan blades to maintain balance. Each of these Pratt & Whitney engines has uh, 22 of these hollow core titanium alloy fan blades. Each fan blade is about, well the overall diameter of the fan section on these engines is 112 inches. The individual fan is about 42 inches long, the base of it is about 12 inches wide, and the the tip of it is about 22 inches wide and the weight is about 34 pounds for every one of these titanium alloy hollow fan blades. So because it's impossible to detect cracks with a visual inspection, cracks on the inside of these hollow fan blades, they have to be sent back to Pratt & Whitney, Whitney engines for the TAI or thermal acoustic imaging process. Also out recently was the final report on the NTSB of the first aircraft in this series that lost a fan blade, United's Flight 1175 back in 2018. Hopefully we'll get Chris on board here, the captain of that aircraft, Chris Benham, to give his side of the story of how this played out for the air crew. But today we'll look at the NTSB report and inside that NTSB report is detailed information as to what was going on at the Pratt & Whitney factory regarding the thermal acoustic inspection of these fan blades and some of the issues they ran into. 
the short version of the United Airlines 1175 story was they were 20, or correction, 200 miles out from Honolulu at flight level 380, just about ready to start their descent into Honolulu when the number two engine, one of the fan blades, I think it was number 11 fan blade, let go right at the shank. And the importance of this, of going through this accident investigation is because this is almost identical to what happened to the United flight leaving Denver just the other day. So on the flight going into Honolulu back in 2018, the number 11 blade let go and it took out a portion of the number 10 blade right next to it and created a huge imbalance in the engine. The blade let go, it was effectively a contained engine failure. The engine, the, the Kevlar, containment ring technology worked in containing the fan out event but when that fan hits the Kevlar containment ring it sets up a huge wave in that containment ring. That huge wave waves around through the engine and begins to break things. It begins to break things like cowling um, attachment points and then the cowling and inlet ring begin to fail and leave the aircraft. Within a matter of two seconds, much of the cowling on the number two engine on United's flight 1175 was gone. And there was a tremendous, a huge amount of vibration with that loss of that blade. Because remember, that one blade weighs 34 pounds or so, plus a chunk, another 10 or 20 pounds of the other blade is missing, creating a huge imbalance. One of the problems the crew had to deal with right away, well, first off, like I said, and let me clarify this a little better, when that catastrophic engine failure occurs and that cowling goes, the aircraft rolls up or banks to nearly 45 degrees of bank. It also pitches up and yaws. So right away you get a very startling change of uh, upset in the aircraft and you need to immediately fly the aircraft back to wings level. And it's very noisy and it's very hard to hear what's going on in the cockpit. The other problem in this particular case is when that cowling failed, it also ripped out the wiring to the EECs, the engine electronic control wiring, so that when you go to troubleshoot this problem, you're looking for your engine gauges, AC dies, DC lies, the engine gauges for the number two engine froze. So the crew could not immediately determine what the heck happened. It was a very startling event and as air crew members we're always tending to fight like a soldier or like a military person. You're always fighting the last war. So you're always thinking about the last accident that's happened and maybe this has happened to you. So since this was the first fan blade failure in a long time that was not the first thought that crossed their mind. They were thinking of some kind of major structural failure, like perhaps a door had failed the aircraft. So those engine instruments froze for a good 30 seconds or more, and then the engine instruments for the number two engine, the right-hand engine, disappeared. And that finally helped the crew begin to troubleshoot the situation that they were dealing with at hand and they were able to shut down the number two engine using the severe, emit, severe damage engine failure checklist. And remember too, on these big jets, you can't see the engine from the cockpit. You can't lean over your shoulder and see the engine. Regarding the use of cameras, remember the 200 series of Boeing 777 does not have cameras, but on this aircraft there was a third pilot on board the aircraft, a what we call FB, first officer in the B position, and he, the captain, sent that first officer back to go take pictures of that engine and bring that data back up to the cockpit so they could figure out what they were dealing with, and that helped tremendously troubleshoot the situation. Now with this cowling gone, this completely negates all your data for a single engine procedure, particularly for a single engine ETOPS procedure. When you get a situation that's this catastrophic, you are basically in the category or the regime or the area of a test pilot. If you're a military pilot, this would be similar to a battle damage assessment, but you don't have a wingman to come up there and quickly check you out. 
<clears throat> but with that third pilot on board, he was able to get back there and get a picture and help explain what was going on to that engine. But now you are in a regime where you are not exactly clear what the limitations are on this aircraft. What are its performance capabilities with this amount of drag? And if you look at the pictures of, of uh, United's 1175, what was left of the cowling was a huge flat plate area of drag. And that completely throws off all of the calculations that you might have for single engine performance for that aircraft. So if you look at the data from the NTSB, they, from 200 miles out, United's Flight 1175 just did a steady descent straight in to the uh, runway in Honolulu and made a successful emergency landing configuring the aircraft late in the game because they weren't sure exactly how affected the flaps were or if they would work at all and same with the landing gear. Fire crews were able to inspect the engine and they were able to taxi to the gate and deplane everybody. One of the questions I get in the comment section is, when you lose an engine on one of these twin engine aircraft, how come you have to descend? Well, the, the snarky answer is gravity. But when these airliner aircraft are designed to operate at the maximum altitude that they can achieve in order to maintain the greatest fuel efficiency for their flight. So as we burn off fuel, we are constantly step climbing up to higher and higher altitudes as the flight progresses. The higher the altitude, the colder the temperatures, the more efficient the engines operate and the more fuel savings are realized. So up at that altitude, that maximum altitude, you can be limited by one of two things, either wing limited or engine limited, and we won't get into that discussion, but you are at the performance edge envelope of the aircraft. So when you lose one engine, of course there's four forces acting on the, on the uh, aircraft, the weight, the lift, the thrust, and the drag, and when you remove one engine from that equation, you are losing more than 50% of your thrust because of the adverse yaw and drag and, and associated with the loss of one engine, you've lost a bit more than 50% of your thrust. So if you were to try to maintain altitude at that maximum altitude on two engines and you lose one engine, your airspeed's just going to start decaying. And so you need to drift down. You need to drift down to a habitable habitable altitude. And so if you maintain your airspeed and let go of the altitude and put max continuous power on the remaining good engine, that aircraft will drift down at that airspeed on its own until it reaches a dense enough level of air where the performance of that one engine can keep the aircraft level at the airspeed that you have selected. So if you're flying in the mid to upper 30,000 feet on two engines on a Boeing 777, you'll find that your single engine habitable altitude is in the low 20s, like 20 or 21,000 feet or so. But if you've got a cowling failure and you have this huge flat plate area drag uh, out on this one engine, those numbers are all out the window. So you're not, it's not really clear what habitable altitude you can maintain on one engine missing a cowling on one of these engines. Now let's talk a little bit about testing. Uh, though I'm an A&P airframe and power plant mechanic, I'm not a jet mechanic or a jet engine mechanic by any means. So I'm gonna need a little bit of help from you understanding this process, but a couple new acronyms we need to learn, NDI, non-destructive inspection, or NDT, non-destructive testing, and TAI, thermal acoustic inspec inspection. So these blades are going back to Pratt & Whitney for a TAI, TAI, or thermal acoustic inspection, which is the technology that allows you to look for cracks inside of a hollow metal object because these cracks that are are propagating from inside the hollow portion of the blade and propagating outward until the until the blade fails so 
remember these blades, these engines were built in the 90s. This is technology that was developed through the 80s. And the thermal acoustic imaging is a relatively new technology. And it's used in a lot of different industries. In medicine, it's even used in artwork to restore historic artwork. But the idea with the blades is first you take the individual titanium alloy hollow blade and the first part of the process is you have to paint the blade. Now I don't understand exactly why at this point, maybe somebody can explain it please in the comment section below why you have to temporarily paint these blades, but I believe it's because that provides an insulation layer for the sensor to work with, but you need to carefully paint the blades in a uniform fashion first and then you apply the the TAI test to them. And so what you do is apply a sound wave to the blade. You know the old uh, ball peen hammer test. You can test various parts of honeycomb structures or, or various structures just by listening to it and tapping on it. But in this situation, you're inducing a sound wave into the blade. And the idea of the technology, the thermal part of it, is that if you have a crack inside that component, those two bits of metal are going to start rubbing together as this sound wave is passing through the blade. And as this cracked area rubs together, it's going to produce a slight amount of heat, a bit more heat than the rest of the blade. And using a very sensitive sensor, you can detect that heat and therefore find a potential crack down inside the hollow core blade. But this is a very sensitive test and it requires a lot of things to go right to prevent a false negative or to get an accurate report. First off, the test they're using, I believe, uses black and white images versus a colorized image, which you might, at the time, this is at the time that they were, that NTSB was investigating Pratt & Whitney following the blade failure on 1175 back in 2018. They were using a black and white image. It also requires a temperature controlled environment because it's a thermal inspection and you're looking for tiny differences in temperature. So you need a carefully controlled temperature environment. And it requires qualified inspectors and uh, they've got some very experienced inspectors there at Pratt & Whitney and if you go through the report see in the comment section below I'll, or the description I'll leave this link they've got three TAI inspectors at Pratt & Whitney each of those guys are very experienced they've been at work at, for the company for at least 30 to 40 years but there was Back in 2018 or 2019 when they were investiga investigating this, they found that there was no real formal training process to learn the intricacies of the TAI inspection. And so the it came down to basically the inspectors had to learn the job themselves by using on-the-job training and when <laughs> when it came to a point where there was an uh, uh, an opportunity to get some official training on this new technology <laughs> they were too busy they had they, there were so many blades coming in through the door to get inspected that the inspectors didn't get the time off to go to the training <sighs> to uh, for the for the TAI inspection this inspection also requires the painting of the blades. Well, the, there are four painters at Pratt & Whitney, and they, they do this work separate from the inspectors, and each painter paints the blades by hand. It's not automatically done, so that means each painter has a slightly different te technique or a little different layer of thickness of paint on each blade, and that's another little variable that the inspectors have to deal with each time they inspect these blades. So the NTSB came up with a list of considerations that Pratt & Whitney should consider to improve their TAI inspection process and a lot of those recommendations were complied with. So it's going to be very interesting to see and I would love to go back to Pratt & Whitney and see firsthand how this process is done. There's been a lot of improvements made to that inspection process and it's going to be very interesting to see where they're at today as a result of these latest blade failures.
So I hope that helps you understand a little bit more about the Emergency Airworthiness Directive and a little bit of the behind the scenes of the NTSB report regarding the fan blade out event for United's Flight 1175. Thanks so much for your support over on Patreon that makes this content possible. We'll see you here. Hey Pete, how did that Orville and Wilbur Wright presentation go while I was gone? Good. Did you get a grade on it yet? Nope. Don't know what you got on it yet? You th what kind of grade did you think you got? A plus. <laughs> you did? Maybe you'll have to make this presentation here to the folks on Blanco Lirio channel and see what they think. <laughs> okay, see you here. Say goodbye, Pete. Bye. <laughs>